middle school, which was just the fundamental, the banking rule of 72, right? The the time value of money, the compounding effect of money, right? That completely was a paradigm shift for me. It's like we think of interest in terms of addition and subtraction, but it's really multiplication, right? So let's think about that from an interest rate standpoint. This is probably one of the most direct things I could say. In the real estate world, what are the three things that everybody say is important? Location, location, location. 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 Okay. Well, in loans, we think interest rate, interest rate, interest rate. Or more specifically, even beyond that, what financial institutions want you to look at is payment, payment, payment. Okay. That's even so we've got real cost, interest, oh, payment, right? They want you to look at the smallest little common denominators. By the way, it's one of the reasons that, among others, but why leasing has become so popular. It's mm. not just to, have to mitigate sticker shock. It's not just for servicing issues, not just to have a pretty new car or buy more than you can afford. Those are all part of it. They got to change all the vernacular. It's no longer interest rate. Right. It's money factor. It's no longer right. value. It's residual. It's no longer down payment. It's cap cost reduction, right? So once you, so once people think, oh, I think I know what these things understand. You mean term, rate, that, oh, let's change all the language. And we see this happen with a lot of things in life, by the way, where all of a sudden we're constantly redefining terms to keep people confused. Crazy. But now let's think about this. It's not so much interest rate as it is how the interest is calculated, how the finance charges are assessed, and how and when the payments are applied. That's the important element, right? So it's all about what type of loan and how does it do those things? That's what determines true debt service cost, true interest volume, or your effective interest rate. We talk about things like blended rate, weighted rate, based on all the debts you have. We're talking about real, true interest cost, which determines the volume and it becomes an effective interest rate. We've used this example before, but it's worth repeating. If theoretically, we'll just engage on this one-on-one, -on -one, CJ. If you had a 6% credit card, unlikely, but let's just say for arguments, you had a 6% line of credit. It could be a personal line of credit, it could be a business line of credit, it could be a home equity line of credit, first or second position. You got a 6% car loan, which actually be pretty good right now, and you had a 6% mortgage, which would be a pretty good rate, but realistically possible now. On the surface, CJ, they all look the same, but they're not. The interest rate, the note rate used to calculate the payment is the same, but the amount of interest you're paying in terms of volume is significantly different. Because if you run up a thousand dollar balance on your credit card and you pay it off before the end of the month you pay zero interest look at that well so did the interest rate matter at all in that equation no what if you had a line of credit and you borrowed a thousand dollars on the first and you paid it back on the 12th or the 17th or the 21st or whatever well you're not going to pay zero interest because that loan calculates interest on an average daily balance which means you're no longer paying 6% on $1,000. You're paying the equivalent of maybe 2 or 3%. But again, was interest rate the dictating factor? Not really. Take a car loan, traditional car loan, not some hybrid million-dollar car that you're financing for 1,000 years. Traditional six-year car loan, up to six years, let's say. Let's say the payment's $500, if you could actually get a $500 payment anymore. And let's say $100 of that goes to interest and $400 goes to principal. Well, you know what happens month two? $100 goes to interest, $400 goes to it stays the same. But guess what loan doesn't work that way? A traditional fully amortized 15 or 30 year mortgage loan because right. it's intentionally designed in a way that front end loads or obviously it's top heavy in terms of interest at the beginning. Now, why does it work that way with a mortgage but not a car? Well, newsflash, we know cars depreciate on average unless it's a classic car and something unusual and rare, but generally they lose 10, 20, 30% the day or the month they drive off the lot. So if every car loan worked like a mortgage loan, 90% of cars on the road right now would be upside down because they'd be paying very little interest and the value would be dropping at the same time. They can only get away with it, theoretically, in mortgages because in theory, mortgages or homes are going to appreciate over time. So if you're kind of treading water, but it's appreciating, you're still making it work. But it all comes down to the amount of interest volume you pay. What is your effective interest rate? Not what you see. What do magicians do? Look at this hand while well, I'm doing this thing down here. That's what ends up happening. Let's focus on the note rate or let's focus on the payment. 
when in reality, what's really going on behind the scenes is how the interest is calculated, how the finance charges are assessed and how and when the payments are applied. That is what determines true interest cost or volume and effective interest rate. You know, I'm actually glad you said that because there's been some pushback that I've gotten from some commenters and the pushback, pushback? has what been- What kind of pushback we talk about here? <laughs> talk, tell me, lay it out. So, so the pushback is this, man, there's no such thing as amortization being different than simple interest, amortized loans being different than the line of credit. And so when I do the example of 6% amortized versus 21%, they refuse, they refuse, Rich, to believe that the 21% simple interest can be, keyword, can be less mm -hmm. than the 6% because okay, of the calculation. Let me, it's let me interject one thing on that. First of all, just to clean up the vernacular a little bit to be okay. specifically and from a compliance standpoint accurate, okay? Right. Okay. It's not necessarily, this can be true, but universally speaking, it's not necessarily simple versus compound interest. It's opened versus closed end interest. Oh, perfect. Okay. Because yeah. that is what determines, let me give you a perfect example. You could pay more money to any debt you have whenever you want. Of course, the problem is people don't, even if they do, they don't know how to calculate exactly the most efficient use to the penny, to the day, to the dollar. And also it's haphazard. Things happen, mm -hmm. life happens and things change. Okay. But when you think about a traditional mortgage scenario, okay, let's take biweekly payments. A lot of people have heard of biweekly payments. Now, will that actually help you trim years off your mortgage, six, seven years potentially on a 30 year mortgage? Yes. But it doesn't, it's not doing what most people actually think it's doing, right? Right. 52 weeks in a year, half of that is 26, half that is 13. So they're fundamentally creating one additional payment a year to principal. That's a good thing. And yes, of course, that gets paid to principal. But what it's not doing, and it is not, and there was a couple of banks that did it years ago, but unfortunately, have pretty much done away with this, other than some very uniquely rare scenarios, 14 day amortization or seven day or otherwise. In other words, if they look at their note, all that crazy paperwork that they get with those other thousand pages when they buy their loan, what it states very clearly is that no additional dollars will be applied to principal until you've satisfied the entire minimum monthly required payment. Now, what do I mean by that specifically in real terms? What that means is if you pay half your payment on the 15th and half your payment on the 30th, just as an example, well, that extra additional amount we just alluded to None of that is actually going to be applied additionally to principal until the 30th day. So it's not being applied in real time. Let's take that a step further. What if you paid one quarter of your payment every week? You could pay one thirtieth of your payment every day. But the reality is it is still not going to apply any of that additional money to principal until the 30th day. What's another example of that? You get a tax refund. People are like, woo, got a tax refund. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. Okay, kumbaya. But guess what they're not thinking about? All that they did was overpay every week or every two weeks or every month on their taxes so the government could use it. And when they get that money back, how much interest did they get? Zero. Because we've been tricked into being caught into lownership of our money, not ownership of our money. Take escrows. Now, in most cases, that's required for lots of reasons. But when they pay your taxes for you, your insurance for you, gee, thanks so much, how much interest did they give you back on the use of your money for the entire year? Somebody might have a three, five, ten, twenty thousand dollar tax bill. They got to use, so they politely paid it for you. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they got to use all. So I want to make a new rule. Anybody in America that wants to start sending me their money for tax and insurance, I'll be more than happy to set aside and make all those payments for you at the end of the year. Because then I get to make the money in that OPM, right? So it's all about getting people out of loanership of their money and getting them into ownership of their money. Remember, possession is nine tenths, right? It's all about having leverage use of the money. So it's an important sort of distinction to make. Um, so I hope that that helps a little bit of clarity. But when you start understanding how it's really working, then the reality is it's open versus closed and interest. And that's not just because you can access it revolving speaking. It's that you can only put into one and not take out. 
So it's already a firmly established amortization schedule. And remember what we talked about previously, contrary to popular belief, probably, amortization schedules are not based on payments. They're divided into payments, but they're actually based on predetermined balance points to get from 200,000 to 195 or 190 or whatever it may be. It just so happens it takes a certain number of payments to get to that point. But if you threw that dollar amount at it tomorrow to that balance point, that predetermined balance point in the future, you eliminate all those payments for principal interest leading up to that point. So again, we could show you all day long. People say, well, how could you borrow money at you know 12% to pay off something at six? Because mm -hmm. six ain't six and 12 ain't 12. Because it's all about how the interest is calculated, how the finance charges are assessed, how and when the payments are applied that determine. So that's where interest cancellation comes into play. Uh, it's not just strategic payoff, right. knowing what to pay optimally and efficiently when. It's part of it. It's not just interest float, taking advantage of the ability to leverage OPM or other people's money efficiently during the period of time that's pre-prescribed. It's part right. of it. It's not just interest accumulation, which yes, there are opportunities for that now, as you alluded to. It could be a money market. It could be three, four, five percent savings. But it's also probably most important and most or least understood interest cancellation. How do we leverage the use of our money to bank like a bank, to leverage every dollar you have, every day you have it until you spend it, to use it to cancel interest you otherwise would have been assessed? Because the less interest you pay, the lower that volume is, the more you reduce that effective interest rate, the more money can go to principal, and therefore you can build equity faster and pay the debt down faster, et cetera. Hope that helps.